Hi everyone, welcome back to Fohammer Videos. Yes, I'm aware how long this video is, but the whole point of having chapters down at the bottom is so that you can skip to whichever legion you find most interesting or you want to get the colors from. And I say colors because whilst I'm employing speed painting techniques here, you can just take the recipes and apply them however you like. If you airbrush, dry brush, normal paintbrush, that's fine. But at least this gives you a breakdown of how I've achieved certain techniques and I use different techniques throughout the video, but regardless of my techniques, you you can still use the recipes, the colour recipes, and apply them however you wish. Right, let's jump in. So, Dark Angels, the first legion. These are one of my favourite legions in Warhammer and the Horus Heresy, and this colour scheme on this is primarily black, unlike the green that you'll get from 40k. Now, I've changed the model about a little bit. I was planning on getting an Old English style Templar bucket helm, but my source for that part just didn't get it to me on time and I need to get the video out. So I'll probably add that later when I do the full guide, but for now, we've just gone with the Beaky Helmet. I have, however, enhanced the model by getting a 3D printed Dark Angels style shoulder pad on the left-hand side, which replaces the studded pad that you get in the standard set. So with these ones, my initial thought was I wanted this black to be different from what we're going to use for the Raven Guard when we do that later in the tutorial. So where they're more of a jet black, the approach to this one is more of a cool black. And the reason for that is because of the red elements that you get on these Heresy Dark Angels. And the blue black, the cool black, is going to be uh, just add a little bit more contrast in the overall scheme. So I started off after priming the model, covering it in Corvus Black, and this isn't a true black, it's a cool grey black, ever so slightly cool, it's, it's between neutral and cool, and I covered the entire model in this, and the reason for that is just to try and take down the blackness of it, so that later when we apply an oil wash, which is another speed painting technique that I'll do to finish the model, we can actually put those shadows back to true black. So again, this grey black is a brilliant base. From there, I started highlighting the forms, so things like the legs, the shoulder pads, by adding Incubi Darkness. And Incubi Darkness is a very cool blue colour. You can hardly see it. I'm only putting the slight amount on the model just to try and change the overall tonal value of the different forms on the miniature. And what I did with the shoulder pad is I'd only affixed this using a bit of silly putty, so it was really easy to just pop off, put it in the same orientation on a bit of silly putty on a piece of cork, and then we could paint that separately. To paint the shoulder pad, I covered it entirely in Incubi Darkness initially, and this is to tie it into the highlights on the rest of the model. From that part, I then covered 75% of it in Mephiston Red, and then the top 25% in Evil Sun Scarlet, giving me a nice dark to light fade across the surface of the shoulder pad. Now you can of course be a bit more traditional and just paint the emblem in red, but I really wanted something that helped these models stand out on the tabletop. So that's my approach to doing it, and I figured this looks really good in the end result. Back to the model itself, I then reinforced the edges using more Incubi Darkness and a dry brush. Now, again, you can just dry brush it and not bother with the airbrush and still get a bit of a blend, but I wanted the smooth blend that you get from an airbrush, and then I reinforced all the edge highlights using Incubi Darkness. To finish it off, I then went all the way up to Celestra Grey, which is a huge tonal shift. But what this does is it shows us, or it gives the impression that the armor is very matte in appearance and therefore doesn't reflect much light. It's only the very fine edges of this armor that actually really reflect any light on it. So that reinforces the matte element to these models, which I think for Horus Heresy for 40K is a really, really good thing to do. And that's the first chapter recipe complete. So obviously you can take this wherever you want, doing your eyes, doing your accessories, doing your weapons, but I'm gonna do a complete painting guide and that will be on our YouTube channel soon. So make sure you subscribe and once it's up, I'll put a link to it in this video. The second one up is the third legion, Emperor's Children. And if you don't know why the second legion's missing, well, go Google it, it's in the law. There's plenty of places explaining why. So with this one, if anybody asks, I'm going to tell them, yep, this was purely intentional. I, this is what I aimed to do and I knew it had happened. But in all honesty, what you're about to see is a happy accident. You see, the standard colors for Emperor's Children is purple. And whilst that's a pretty interesting color in its own right, and it's rather unique, whenever I've looked at people painting Emperor's Children, they look kind of boring. And no matter what I looked at, I could not figure out how I wanted to, to go through this guide and, and show it to you. So I kind of just made it up and thought, well, what technique haven't I used? And let's just take that approach and see what happens. 
So back to the painting approach. Now, what I did here was take some Liquitex ink because we're doing the pre-shading technique that a lot of people do. This works very well with an airbrush. So it's not something I'd recommend if you don't have an airbrush, but you can get a similar zenithal e spray with a spray can. But the problem is you're not gonna be able to be as direct as you can be with an airbrush. So a lot of people suggest what paints to use this for. Now I use Liquitex inks because I know how to use them. It comes out a bit speckly, but once we get the color over it, it hides all of that speckle. Some people have said thinning down some Tamiya, I think it's titanium white or flat white with some of their thinner goes great through an airbrush. In my experience, I can't get it working. I'm gonna keep trying until I get that right, but that doesn't work for me. So anyway, what we're doing up here is slowly building up, steadily building up the shading on the model. So like we did in the previous model, the forms themselves are going to be highlighted. And this color is great for slowly building up more and more white until we get to a final pure white. One thing I've noticed with this is if you're going to use this stuff, if you're then going to brush paint on the transparent color afterwards, give this titanium white a good several hours to dry. If you try and paint it on with a brush afterwards, it'll actually react with the paint in many cases and cause it to crack. So I wouldn't do that. Just spraying it on is fine, but if you're brushing it on, just give it a few hours to dry. What it does with Tamiya, I don't know. I've not got that working, but there's a tip for you with this paint. Once you pre-shade down, it was actually really simple to build up the purple color. I used the Magos Purple, Magos, Mergos, Magos, Magos Purple contrast paint from Games Workshop. And when I sprayed this down initially, it was turning pink and I started to panic thinking, yeah, I'm going to need to respray this model and start again. But using it and spraying it on my texture palette, I realized that, yeah, after a good few coats, it'll build up a nice solid cover. So this took three or four coats and I was able to build up a solid purple color. I sprayed most of it from below and that left some of the upper areas that nice pinky color. So instead of a purple model, I ended up with a bit more of a plum model, which has come out nice, but then I was struggling to think, well, how am I going to highlight this? The thing is to highlight colors, it's normally nice to add a bit of yellow, a bit of luminosity. It's something that uh, we're told by Angel uh, Angel, Angel Giraldez quite often. He always said, you know, yellow is luminosity, add that. But yellow is the opposite of purple on the color spectrum. So anything I do would just mute down the purple. And in fact, that's what I ended up going with in the end is just a more muted and brighter red purple color. And we used cacophony, cacophony, cacophony purple, which is, oh, sorry. Yep, cacophony purple. I'm looking at the paint right now and used that as a dry brush edge highlight to bring out all the edges on the model. And I am super happy with the result. Complete and total accident. And I don't know if I'll be able to replicate it. I'm sure I will, but that's how we got here. And if you want to repeat it, I think you'll agree. This brings out an incredibly nice scheme. Once again, when I complete the full painting guide, I will put a link up on this video, but to make sure you don't miss it, please subscribe. Next up is Iron Warriors, the fourth legion. And for this one, I really wanted to lean into that weathered old iron look. So starting with the model primed in black, I then went in initially with Rhinox Hide to really add some warmth to the shadows. It's a dark color, but the Rhinox Hide, the red of that brown really, really gives us some warmth. And the good thing about this guide and this technique is we're not actually using the airbrush at all. Other than that base layer, the rest of the guide, you don't really need the airbrush, which is really Really, really good for those of you who have an aversion to airbrushing. The next option after that is choosing my silver and there's a lot to choose from when you look at all the different ranges. Personally though, my favorite, the one that I went with in the end is one of the Dark Star Metallics, a really undersung brand. They're incredible metallics. They're as good as Scale 75's metallics, but there's a lot more in the silver and gold spectrum available to you in that range. And I went with the blue steel. It's only got an ever so slight blue tint, but that's gonna contrast really nicely against the red tones in the initial base layer, which again was Rhinox Hide. And yes, I know a lot of people are going to say that actually the Iron Warriors rejected the Mark VI armor. Well, you know, it's Games Workshop lore. Perhaps we can redact that. We constantly do. But look, I tried to make this as Iron Warriors looking as possible. So I took the head and the shoulder pad from the Betrayal at Kalf box set, which I think was the Mark IV armor. And then the right hand side shoulder pad or 
his, his no his left hand side shoulder pad your right uh, that shoulder pad was actually a 3d printed part again available on cults 3d and this i just printed out on my printer and then stuck on there which you know it matches the one that's already on the other side but it gives me the the icon and the iconography making it much much easier to paint so when you speed painting having that on there is going to save a ton of time so just dry brushing in that blue steel and if you don't know already know then this dry brushing techniques whilst it's really good at blending and it's especially good with metallics if you've never dry brushed metallics i implore you to try it it will still leave us with a bit of a mottled texture and that's going to be really good because you'll see by the end this is what gives the age to that steel color so you'll see it's absolutely brilliant when we come to the end and it looks it looks realistic so yeah dry brushing all the way with this one and if you haven't got an artist opus series d dry brush again you can get one in our starter set which has got various ranges of brushes and is the perfect entry level if you haven't got one of those then you can use gw dry brushes uh, there are cheaper options available and yes there's makeup brushes out there but to me these are the ones that give the most consistent result with the best amount of control so yeah i am trying to sell you on them of course i am i've got my own brush set but i wouldn't have it if i didn't think they were awesome to add just a little bit more contrast on here, I'm going to take some of this Model Air Silver, which is a really potent silver colour. And with this, again, I'm going back in with the dry brush, but I'm only picking out the very raised edges of the model. So this will be able to just highlight them and make sure the uh, each individual form, things like the kneecap, things like the elbows, that these will actually stand out and look like individual parts of the model and it separates it out a bit. So I highly recommend doing this. The bit I wasn't sure whether or not to include in this part of the guide was doing the hazard stripes, but to be fair, it is really part of the armor and we're trying to do all of the armors in this video. So in order to do hazard stripes, I started with eshing gray and then just filled in the areas that I want to have hazard stripes on them. I decided to put a hazard stripe down the leg. I didn't want to do a whole leg because it just, it's hard to do and it looks weird on this type of model. But having it down the side of the leg did two things. One, it just gave a little bit more hazard stripiness to this model, but it also hid the bit where one of the mold lines, I hadn't really scraped it off quite nice and the dry brushing had picked that out. So if you want to do that, it's just a great way to hide some of the imperfections in the build on the model, which is what I did it for here. Over these grey areas, I thinned down some Black Templar contrast paint using the contrast medium and built up a, a few layers of the black so that the grey would actually transition from grey to black. To be honest, I just slapped this down and then used my finger to wipe it off in the raised areas and that did a good enough job because the next stage is going to do the majority of what we need. After this, I masked off the stripes using strips of masking tape and I used one piece of masking tape between each stripe so that I could get them consistent and even. Once we'd done that and got it all masked off on the shoulder pad and the stripe on the leg, it was then just a case of stippling on some Avalon Sunset in the entire area that was exposed and didn't have any tape over it. Once we'd done that, it was just a case of stippling again up to Yariel Yellow and that gave us the transition on the surface of the model. So we've actually got not only the yellow and the, well, the black's already been shadowed and highlighted, we've done the same with the yellow. So it keeps that uniformity of light is coming from above and it goes from a lighter colour to a darker colour down the form on the model. Once again, I'll put a link here to the full video once it's gone live, but make sure you don't miss it by subscribing to our channel. Now with white scars, I haven't gotten too far yet because I haven't fully decided where I want to paint the red on this model. So I'm just gonna show you how to do the white. But with this white, because of the red, the contrast to that is blue. So I'm showing you here how to do a cool white. Now, I actually painted this wrong at first. I started painting it with Storm Vermin Fur, which is a brown gray color, and that's not what we want. We want a blue gray color, a lighter, uh, cooler hue. So I swapped this out and ended up just painting over the whole thing with Dark Reaper. Now, arguably, had I painted the Dark Reaper directly over black rather than over Storm Vermin Fur, it would have resulted in a darker color in the beginning, but hey-ho, this still works. So long as it's a dark gray blue of any kind, then that's what you want as your base layer. Comparing this to World Eaters, which you can see are going to be a warm gray, these two colors have the same tonal value, but one of them's on the warm side of the spectrum, one's on the cool side of the spectrum. And we're gonna carry this on with the next stage, which is all through and gray, which we're going to apply from above and cover most of that earlier color. Now, when you look at all through and gray in the bottle, you'll see that it looks like a blue more than it looks like a white. But 
that's only when you're comparing it to colors next to it, like true white. When we put it on the model here, you can already see in this video that it actually reads as white to the eye. And the benefit of this is when you look at it from a distance, it looks cool and gives us that slight contrast to the red that we're gonna put on the trim later. It also means we can highlight up to a court, to a really pure white if we want any of the areas to really stand out like they're ultra reflective. And once again here, you can see the tonal difference. Both models from a distance look white. One of them's cool, one of them's warm, although I went a bit heavy with the World Eaters model. For the final stage of the highlight, I'm still not going up to pure white. I'm actually using Corax white, which is, it's more neutral than it is cool, but I haven't really got a cool blue of this value in my set. So I'm using this just again with the dry brush and I'm picking out all the edges. So it looks like we've edge highlighted it, but instead of it taking me a day to do one model or hours to do one model, it's took me about three minutes. And now only finally are we moving up to white scar, but even here, I'm gonna let this mix in with the previous color so that we don't have any pure white areas on the model because it may be too striking and too distracting. So with this, again, dry brushing with the Artist Opus Series D medium, I'm not gonna pick out all the areas I picked out before. I'm just gonna pick out the furthest, mo furthermost extremities on the model to make sure they stand out. Once again, when it's live, I will put a link up to the full video at the top of this section, but so that you don't miss it, please make sure you subscribe. So now onto the space walls, which once again are one of my favorite chapters. I love space Vikings. Everybody loves Vikings at the moment. They're really popular and space Vikings are the coolest. Now, when it comes to Horus Heresy, space Vikings are a really, really dull color to paint. It's essentially Mechanicus standard gray with Dawnstone painted on top of it. Mm boring. Now, the modern the modern Space Wolves, as we all know, have become baby blue. They used to be an ice blue, but now they've become baby blue. I don't know where in the 10,000 years all the Jarls sat around the table and went, you know what we need, guys? We need a rebrand because we're coming across as aggressive and we need to say, we'll kill you, but we're approachable. Let's go with baby blue. Anyway, I want to add a bit more interest to this because gray is dull. So what I'm starting with is green and this is not turned green and this stuff is dying. They're actually getting rid of the air version of this paint. As far as I'm aware, the actual base color is gonna stay. And this, I love this green because it's actually a black green, which not enough companies do. And you can only just see it. Even after several coats applied on the model, I've actually turned up the contrast in these videos. But when you look at the model under natural light, it looks black but with a hint of green. I love this colour because it just ever so slightly shifts your eye into a new hue. So once that's on, we're then gonna go in with Dark Reaper, and this is gonna be a full zenithal highlight. I know I normally say cover the forms, but really we're just gonna do a 45 degree from above, nice and simple Dark Reaper coverage along the whole thing. That green, I only want slightly in the shadows. And again, the green through the blue spectrum into gray kind of gives us that early suggestion that these guys are heading in the blue color scheme that they will be in the future and this is what I wanted to get on the model but honestly it's just a little bit more interesting than boring old gray Oh, and as for the parts, which I forgot to mention, well, there's only two things I've really added here. The shoulder pads are both from the Horus Heresy box set. I just didn't use the, the studded shoulder pad, uh, but I've given him a horn in the back. The head is from Cults 3D and so is the tabard. And I think they were all free, I can't remember. So definitely an awesome addition to the models. And I like the fact that Horus Heresy, it's oldie worldy. This oldie styly Viking Space Marine helmet goes really well. And the best thing is because it's a, a very unique style, I'm pretty confident it doesn't even slightly beach, breach any of GW's IP and instead does the best thing that 3D printers do. It enhances the hobby rather than threatens it. So yeah, definitely recommend these. I love them, but you know, it's your hobby. Do something in your style. So next up, I'm now going in with the Mechanicus Standard Grey, but this is where I'm focusing on applying it to the individual forms. I want to leave the transition into the very smallest amount of the Dark Reaper that we applied in the previous stage. So things like the chest, most of it's going to be Mechanicus Standard Grey. The shoulder pads, I'd say 50 to 60% is Mechanicus Standard Grey. But when you look at the model and spin it round, from the sides, you'll see the transition. And then if you flip it underneath, you'll see that green color, like the underside of the shoulder pad will still be that green color, which adds a lot more visual interest than just gray through to black. 
and then to edge highlight once again because it's really quick and really fast i'm going to be dry brushing in some dawnstone and i'm going to use this to just edge highlight the model pick out all the edges and then that should increase the visibility of the individual forms the individual parts of the armor and then finally once that's done i'm going in with administratum gray and then we're just going to pick out the finest again most extruded most sticky out points on the corners of the model sometimes when you do this try and go for even though an area is dark try and put some light next to it so in things like the the bottoms of the inside of the leg you'll find that's the darkest point the edge around there highlight that because it does enhance the model and it's yeah it's more rule of cool than rule of real when it comes to lighting but it does make the model pop and it makes the different parts of the model especially the shadow areas look a lot better so with the seventh legion we're painting yellow and i know a lot of people have problems with yellow well my advice to you is twofold one get an airbrush because it makes it so much easier sorry but if you're painting yellow yes it is a pain to paint because trying to get yellow over any color I mean, yellow other than orange yellow is the worst color to paint on anything so either get an airbrush or get pro acryl paints because the coverage of those is absolutely excellent so those are my two tips unless you're going to spray paint the entire model yellow in the first instance then either of those two things are the option you want to choose now the first thing we want to do with these as you're seeing is get away from black because black and yellow make a horrible muddy color that we don't want anywhere near imperial fists and yeah we're going with a bit more of a grim and dark style for these ones but we don't want yellow over black you never want yellow over black ochre over black is sometimes okay but you definitely want to get away from black so we're starting with mournfang brown as the base and that's going to give us a much more rich and natural color for yellow to come from when we start to go into and do the highlights and speaking of those highlights they begin and end really with avalon sunset this is going to be the majority of what you put on this model avalon sunset is more towards ochre than it is towards yellow but again porous heresy grim dark bit of a dulled yellow i think this works better for heresy in my opinion the last thing you want is a bright lemon yellow heresy model hey it's you again it's your hobby maybe that'll look cooler so you know do what you like Customizations wise on this guy, the beakies just didn't look right to me for Imperial Fist. So I put again one of the old betrayal at Calth. I think it's a Mark IV head on there. The actual the the insignia on the uh, in his right shoulder pad, your left, uh, that was a 3D printed model that I think came from Colts 3D. So it was just a, a 3D print that I added on there. The shoulder pads I think are quite obvious. They're just two of the studded shoulder pads from the set. But a few people might actually notice the gun. Barrel. So that gun barrel, again, is from a weapon at Betrayal at Calth. And the reason why I did this swap is because when drilling the gun barrel on the original model, I actually ruined it and drilled out the side of it. So my only way of recovering this without having to rebuild a whole new model was to just cut one of the gun barrels off an old bolter and stick that on. But I actually think this adds a lot more interest to it. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't recommend you going out there and buying loads of the old models just so that you can cut the bolter ends off and change these. But the fact that I had one spare and because I'd ruined it I ended up with a happy accident that just made me a more interesting model in the end of it. Anyway with this once again spray on the the color the ochre color the avalanche sunset and focus on the forms of the model so don't just give it a 45 degree all the way around this time aim the speed aim at the specific areas so pick out things like the curve on the top of the backpack the tops of the shoulders the chest the legs anything that sticks out should be in light anything that's underneath should really be dark and build up a slow and steady transition avalon sunset airbrushes beautifully whether you've got the air version or you've got the normal version so if you do have an airbrush this should be a brilliant color to get on once it's all painted and shaded, it's really easy. All you need to do then is go in with Yariel Yellow and I am once again just using this to airbrush and do all the edge highlighting. If you don't have, uh, sorry, dry brush, not airbrush, I'm dry brushing all of the edge highlighting. You can paint it on yourself however you like. Uh, if you have a normal brush and want to spend the hours doing that, yep, go for it. Again, I will argue that that is... That is so in the opposite direction of army painting. You don't need to do that. I very much prefer this approach for getting things out fast. But 
again, you do you, it's your hobby, it's about the recipe here that matters. So again, airbrush, uh, sorry, airbrush, edge highlight with Yariel yellow and you will get a really nice result. You don't want too much of this, I don't think, because then it'll bring it into the bright spectrum and it doesn't look very heresy. And finally, to make those edges pop, I went in with some Screaming Skull, and this just adds a really bright highlight to the edges. Again, Screaming Skull, it's an off-white, it's more on the warm spectrum, it's a yellowy white. Games Workshop don't do what would be best, which is an ice white colour. I've not seen a good ice white from them. Other brands do it. I think AK do a good one, Vallejo do a good one. But in lieu of that, Screaming Skull, maybe let it mix in with a bit of the Yariel yellow as well, and that'll really make your edges pop and stand out. Once again, I will post a link here when the full video of the full guide of the whole model comes out, but well, please subscribe so that you don't miss it. The Eighth Legion are Night Lords, and these are once again one of my favourite chapters. I absolutely love the idea of space vampires. Obviously, you've got Blood Angels, which are the good space vampires, and then you've got Night Lords, which are the evil space vampires. And considering one's blue, one's red, they're opposite to each other on the colour spectrum. Yep, they are literally the, essentially, Blood Angels would be the, the heroes, and these are the antagonists. In fact, why haven't they made a vampire versus vampire game? Anyway, so a few alterations I did with this model. As you may notice, it's based on the sergeant style of build. So most of the model is that sergeant style of build. All I've really done here is add a head and then a 3D printed shoulder pad. So these are some really cool additions. I honestly think I've got a bit OTT with the wings on the shoulder pad, but I am not there wasn't anywhere that was doing a skull style shoulder pad. I can't freehand a skull onto a beaky helmet and I wasn't going to pay Games Workshop £30 for a set of 10 heads when I only want one of them to do this video. So if you're making a squad of these, then yeah, Games Workshop, uh, Forge World specifically, do a really, really good set of heads for the Night Lords and shoulder pads and things like that. Yet. so I highly recommend picking those up. With this we are painting it Night Lords Blue and this is the air version of their paint because I don't have the any other version of it. You can get standard colour versions however you want and with this we're going to coat the entire model and make it a really dark deep blue. Once that's done, I'm then going in with Cantor Blue very lightly because we don't want to make this too bright. It needs to stay a very dark model or it won't look very Night Lordy. So with this, yep, we're just painting on Cantor Blue, focusing on the forms again, so the top of the backpack, the top of the shoulder pads, any knees that stick out, any feet that stick out, any shin plates that stick out, the chest, the lower part of the chest, all those areas, we're going to create individual transitions from the light blue to the darker blue. And then for edge highlighting, really simple, once again, Artis Opus Series D medium dry brush, we're using McCrag Blue, and we're just going to blast this all over the model to pick out all of the edges that we possibly can. Again, going for rule of cool, not rule of real, I'm not trying to win any awards with this painting style, I'm just trying to get a good looking army style painted fast, and this is the best way to do it. So pick out as many edges as you can, try and focus on any that stick out the furthest, you definitely want to get those covered, and just get the entire model edge highlighted in McCrag Crag blue, no time at all. Again, two, three minutes per model, if that. And then finally, for the furthermost extremities, just a bit of Calgar blue. And again, let this mix in with the McCrag blue. You don't want it too bright. So if you're using it with the Series D, then just stick it next to each other on the palette. Once again, just pick out very lightly, pick out only the furthest most extremities. So here, the foot that sticks forward, the kneecap, the back of the shin that sticks out, anywhere on the chest. Try and, when you're doing this dry brushing, turn the model upside down and do it from below. That tends to pick up a few more of the edges, which I find is a really cool approach to doing this. So again, just pick out the edges with this. You don't want to go too harsh because you don't want it too bright. You want to keep it in the dark spectrum. Now, I was going to go further with this for this part of the guide, but I'm kind of scratching my head. Where do I want to go next? Do I want silver rims? Do I want brass rims? I definitely need to get some red in there. So things like the wings on the helmet and then the skull. I've got the AK Generation 3 acrylics to review. So I'm probably going to paint that skull as part of the review for those acrylic paints. Um, and I'll do that in a different video. And then the other thing, the bit that terrifies me because I'm no good at doing it, is painting the lightning bolts on that. I'm rubbish at freehand, you know, so I try and use decals where possible. So whilst I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to approach this for the full guide, then yeah, that's where I'm sticking at for now. Just a reminder, like the other ones, once the full guide's live, I'll post a link here in this video, but please subscribe so that you don't miss it when it comes out.
So coming from the bad space vampires to the good space vampires, I'm now painting Blood Angels. And I've done a lot of Blood Angels in my time, so I wanted to do something really different with these to make them stand out and look just different because they're heresy models and everything else out there is, you know, very, very dull red. So what I'm going to do here is a little bit of colour theory tuition and go through some absolute insanity as to how we are going to paint these models. And they're going to be super high contrast, really, really vibrant. A lot of people say they don't read as red. Well, have a look at my Instagram. You'll see where once you've applied an oil wash, they do. They look red. Um, the shadows look terracotta. The highlights look a little bit more muted than they're going to end up here. But this is an incredibly vibrant, high contrast color, color scheme that you can apply to your models if you so wish. So just a bit of background, when I was growing up, I used to have an argument with my friends. I didn't paint Blood Angels at the time, and I'm talking when I was 13 or 15. They would always argue, Blood Angels aren't red, they're actually orange, there should be a Blood Angels orange color. Fair enough, but for whatever reason, that stuck with me. So I'm actually going to paint these. If you have a look at a color wheel, I'm going to paint these as a red-orange color overall to just try, try and, you know, be a bit more on the fence and be the middleman in that 20-odd-year-old argument that I had with a bunch of 13-year-old mates that I don't even speak to anymore. So the overall color is going to be red-orange. Now, I really want to go through the color spectrum here. Highlights, as I've said in earlier parts of this, highlights when it's sunny, the natural sunlight is very much on the warmer, more luminous side of the color spectrum. So any highlights would really be yellow. So if we take a color wheel and we look at red orange, which is my middle, and we go round to the right or left, whichever way your color wheel is, uh, round to yellow, it's actually three colors away. So if my highlights are in the yellow spectrum and they're three colors away, the opposite direction, three colors away, is violet. So I'm starting with the shadows and I'm going to be painting them with violet. Oh, and that violet specifically is Nagaroth Knight. Oh, and as for building this model, well, I only really customized it in one way. I got ahead again online from Cults 3D. Other than that, the model is exactly as you would build it out of the Horus Heresy pop set. So the first part of the armor, we're building it up again. And like I've said in previous parts of the video, focusing on the forms individually rather than just a 45 degree spray paint, we're going to be using Fist and Red and we're going to slowly build up this color. We don't want much of the purple left. We only want it really in the deepest shadows. But again, it will inform your eye. It will have an ever so slight effect on how you view the red. And it actually makes it a lot more vibrant. Moving on from there, we're going to Wild Rider Red, and this is where we bring in the red orange. So this is going to highlight the red that we've got on there. And once again, we're focusing on the forms of the model. We're going to be airbrushing this. You can apply it however you want. You can dry brush it. You can glaze it if you ever, if you like, and you've got the time to do that. But we're going to use this to highlight the areas that we've previously painted in red. So things like the face, we want to draw attention to the face. So that definitely needs a lot of highlight on it. And also we're doing this from the side. So when you look at the model from the front, you can actually see that line down the middle and it's got an immediate contrast between the dark left side and the the brighter right side of that face and um, again yours not his so when you look at this when you've actually got the highlight on there it'll give a lot more contrast initially on the surface of the model so it just looks a lot more brighter a lot more vibrant and it'll stand out a lot further on the tabletop now, edge highlighting, as you've seen, I always go in with the Series D dry brushes, but I wanted to do this next bit to make a point. Now, a lot of people complain about how bad yellow is for coverage, but those people obviously haven't tried orange. There's a reason why there are no orange chapter Space Marines. Orange is the worst cover for coverage. It's not yellow, it's orange. So in order to combat this, what I've done is a pre-shade. So I've shown you here just how bad the coverage is. That, that orange isn't vibrant at all. In fact, you can hardly see it. But going in with some screaming skull and doing an initial pass with that really quick gives us a base layer an under layer to paint over and as soon as we've got the screaming skull on we go back in with orange and you'll see that that pops immediately going over the lighter brighter color and then because we're dry brushing it in it actually blends in easier as well so where it goes directly on the red it ends up with darker orange where it goes over the screaming skull it ends up as a lighter orange and you can blend it in and smush it in easier Thus, it gives you a more consistent, a more solid and stable blend and gets rid of a lot of that mottling you tend to get with this dry brush technique. 
Now you can stop here and I think you'll agree that's a fairly solid Blood Angel, but I wanted to push things further. So I went in with Yoriel Yellow and started dry brushing this on as well. And this is what really pushes the highlights into the brighter end of the spectrum. So again, if you're happy with this, stop here. I wanted to just go further to show you what it'll do. And as you'll see, this will really make the model stand out. Some people will argue that it makes it look not Blood Angel, almost like a terracotta angel. But again, once we go in there with a, a wash with an oil wash, it's going to mute everything back down and bring it back down anyway into the red spectrum. And it, the colors that we're going to use in the oil wash when we do the full video, again, subscribe, keep an eye out for that, will actually mute this back down. And the shadow colors will reinforce a lot of this and make any of the oranges look more red, any of the yellows look more orange. Trust me, stick with me. When we get to the final one, it's really going to pop and it's going to look a lot more Blood Angel. If I fail, because some of this is guessing, um, if I fail, then I can always just go over it with a red glaze through the airbrush and that'll take no time at all. But again, trust me on this, stick with me. It's going to look like a Blood Angel, a red Blood Angel by the end of it. And then just to really make it bright, to really go insane, we are going in with Screaming Skull on the furthest most extremities, a very light amount of this. And we're going to let that mix in with the yellow as well. Once again, GW don't do a nice ice yellow, which is unfortunate. Their closest is Screaming Skull, which is a warm, warm white. So going in with that, and that's going to really make some of the most sticky out edges, that's going to make them really pop. I'll put a link up here when the full guide goes live, but please subscribe so that you don't miss it. So next up we have the 10th Legion, Iron Hands, and these I just really wanted to make sure I was doing this different to how we'd done Iron Warriors earlier. So really it's the same start, we're just going to use different silvers and I'll show you how they react. A couple of things here I've done to customise the model, so first off the head is from Colts 3D, it's a downloaded 3D print, so is the arm, but the arm is actually way too oversized for this size of model. In fact if you look at it from behind or, or underneath where you can see where the arm goes into that shoulder pad, there's just a big wadge of green stuff in there holding it all together. And if you actually have a look where he's holding the gun, then he's holding it at like a weird off angle. So you can't tell when you're looking at it from the front, so it'll do, but yeah, it was a dodgy way to put it together. The only thing that I've done differently is these shoulder pads as well. They are 3D prints and these have a bit of a model texture, which you'll see pop out in a minute when we start to do the dry brush. So quite heavily customized, but you kind of need that when you're doing iron hands so you can get some of the mechanical elements into the actual Space Marine himself. So like I did with the Iron Warriors, I just based the entire thing in Rhinox Hide, but this time we're going in with, well, yeah, Iron Hand Steel. It, it seems to make sense, doesn't it? So yeah, going in with Iron Hand Steel, we are once again just dry brushing this, going over the surface because the dry brushing, as I said with Iron Warriors, creates that mottled effect, which is really good for a uh, metallic, realistic metallic surface. And the brown underneath shows a little bit of weathering, like it's not brand new metal, it's you know metal that's been out in the elements for some time. If you have a look at real steel in the environment, it doesn't tend to rust as easily Easily, but what it will do is it'll start to go brown and just lose its silvery vibrancy. So having a brown undercoat with a silver over the top, great way to do these and they are a super fast legion to paint in this way. Like before, I'm using Runefang Steel this time and we are going to be picking out the edge highlights. As you can see, I've done most of my shading using the Iron Hand Steel in the first step. So uh, like with an airbrush, I've focused on the forms. I've tried to get more of the paint in at the top and then leave it in the shadowy areas. And I'm doing the same here with the silver color from Games Workshop. As I've done previously, I normally say like the best color to use here for any highlighting when you're dry brushing is definitely the Vallejo Air Silver Color. Byron uses a lot, uses it a lot on his Artist Opus videos because it's really potent and really strong. The Citadel colors aren't quite as good. What I'm doing here though is on some of the elements like the arm, the mechanical elements and the face, I'm really focusing a lot of this paint on there so I can bring it out. And I'm just making it look like things like the arm are an ever so slightly different metallic to the armor just by painting it a lot more and making it a lot brighter. Once we get some washes in there, it'll end enhance it even further but again this is a really quick and simple legion to paint all you need to do this is paint it with silver dry brush it silver over a brown and then paint the shoulder pads black that's it the whole thing's painted then and anybody would happy to be have that on, to have that on their tabletop 
Once again, I'll do a full guide, which I'll link here, but please subscribe so that you don't miss it when it comes out. So the 12th Legion, World Eaters. Now, there's a few arguments between what the shoulder pads color is going to be on here. Some of the official artwork shows them as red, some of them shows them as blue. Now, as much as I like the fact that they've moved to red in 40k, I like the blue, it looks a bit better. And also, for the sake of this video, it lets us do the opposite of what we did with white scars. So because those shoulder pads are going to be blue, this time I've gone for a warm white, a brownie or reddy white, in order to contrast that blue a lot better and just give a lot more interest to the model. Now, as for parts used on this, I got the heads from Colts 3D. I think they're called Butcher Buckets or something. Uh, the shoulder pad, his left shoulder pad, the one on your right, was also from Colts 3D. The one on his right, your left, is uh, just, it's from the Betrayal at Calth box set again because it matches the style. The arms I also found on Colts 3D, but I couldn't figure out where, and that's how the model was built, ready for priming. And just for reference, in case you skip to this section, this is what I mean in the difference between warm and cool. So we've got the warm grey here for the World Eaters, and we've got the cool grey for the White Scars. So the base colour was Storm Vermin Fur, and with that I've just coated the entire model. On top of this, I'm then going with grey sear, because this is ever so slightly on the warm end of the spectrum. It's a good base colour, and with this I'm covering the entire model, and I'm making sure to concentrate on the form. So things like the lines, the legs are cylinders, so I'm doing a line up those. The shoulders, I'm aiming for the top. I don't know why I am, because I'm going to paint them blue in a minute. I just wasn't paying attention. I'm going to make the head a lot brighter than the rest of the model, but I'm also also going to make sure I highlight the arms here as well because this is going to give me a zenithal shade on the arms and create the values for me and make those much easier to paint later because we've already got the shading in we're just going to use a contrast paint to bring that white out and make it look like a flesh tone. Now I'll be honest I went a little bit heavy with the grey sear here and I probably should have left a lot more of that storm vermin fur so do what I say not what I do and leave some of that but here it is against the white scar so you can see how one of them reads as cool white one of them reads as warm white. And then to edge highlight it, once again, I'm going with the Artis Opus Series D medium dry brush. And this I'm just doing for speed, as I've said. And we're going in initially with Corax White. Now this is a fairly neutral white, but since we're only doing the highlights, it's not really gonna matter too much. I'm also using White Scar in here. And what I'm gonna do is start by edge highlight edge highlighting it with Corax White, going all the way over the surface, picking out all of the edges that I can, just to make each individual form stick out and stand out a lot more. But then I'm gonna start mixing in some of the white scar. I'm not gonna to go to pure white, but I'm gonna let it slowly mix in and build up some of those edge highlights so that it gets lighter and lighter around the furthest, most sticky out extremities on the model so that you actually get some slight but visible uh, contrast, some, some tonal contrast on the highlights themselves so it doesn't look like you've just lazily done it, you have actually put some thought into where light is going to be the brightest. Again, rule of cool, not rule of real. It's not actually going to look like that truly, but you know, it gives enough interest on the model that you can get away with it. I'm also going to make sure when I do this, I'm going to focus on the arms and try and bring them up to pure white so that it's ready for the next stage. Now, unlike previous models where I've popped the shoulder pads off, when I was building this, again, I'll be honest, if you look at this from behind, it looks abysmal. I've literally just wedged these arms in with a big chunk of green stuff, which is why the shoulder pads are at a weird off angle. So I didn't have the option to snap these off in order to paint them, and I'm not as controlled with the airbrush as I'd like to be. I know people like Cult of Paint are very direct and don't get any overspray on shoulder pads, but I'm not that brave. So to protect the model, I've covered everything that I'm not going to spray in Silly Putty, which again, you can get online, just go to eBay or Amazon, Google Silly Putty and you'll find it. It's just much better to use than something like Blue Tack, which is too sticky and gets into the recesses and stick to the model, ends up pulling paint off. Silly Putty, absolutely perfect from when you're masking models up. Once it's masked up, I'm going to do what I do with an ultramarine. In fact, I painted this at the same time as I painted my ultramarine and we're going to cover it first in Macrag Blue. And then really simple, from above, I'm going to add a transition with Calgar Blue. And again, just focus on the upper parts of the, of the shoulder pads and try and give it a 50-50. So maybe halfway down is where you want the fade to be from the Macrag Blue to the Calgar Blue or, or Calgar to Macrag Blue so that we've got some actual visible tonal transition on the surface of the model. And I'm not going to apologize, I'm just going to leave this here because I love watching the color reveal when you take Silly Putty off a model. So at least I've sped it up for your, uh, your benefit, but I think it looks really cool to watch. 
Now, the arms themselves are just painted with a thick coat of contrast paint. And what really helped me here was the fact that I jumped the gun a bit. And before I painted the shoulder pads, I actually glossed the model ready for its decals. So I shouldn't have done that. I should have done the shoulder pads, then glossed it. But this has actually helped me out here. I've glossed it before I've used the contrast paint because the gloss coat, like with a wash or any transparent color, makes the surface a lot more hydrophobic. So what this gives us is a really easy way to put the contrast paint down and it, ex it accentuates the properties of contrast paints. So what you end up doing is you get a little bit of surface staining, but then the contrast paint actually runs into the recesses a lot better than it would if you just had it as a matte color. Now, I wasn't intending to go into metallics on this video because I wanted quick, but the arms just look daft without having that edge highlight on because of where I'd masked it off previously. So here I'm using Vallejo's metal, not metal color range, Vallejo's liquid metal range. Don't confuse it with the metal color range. These are a very different type of paint. They're a gorgeous paint, but they are alcohol based, which means you need something like isopropyl to clean it off your brush and you need to use a synthetic brush. So on, even though I love my Artis Opus brush, I'm not going to ruin any of them by dipping them in isopropyl alcohol and destroying and killing the natural hairs. So the Citadel, Citadel STC range of brushes are really good for this. It was actually warped before the video, but I just dipped it into some boiling water and retrained the end. And going steadily with this, you'll find that it is an instant one coat paint. It looks so bright, vibrant, so beautiful, so gold. In fact, it's such a realistic gold color that if you don't protect it afterwards with a gloss coat or a matte coat, it'll actually start to oxidize in the air. But what this will give me is a really smooth metal coat in one coat that's super vibrant. I know a lot of people like scale colors, dark star colors and things like that. But if I wanted those to stand out, I mean, those are metallic acrylic paints. They would already be a bit more glooping, gloopy than normal flat, flat acrylic paints. But what you'll find with these is they go on really smooth. This means I don't have to pre-shade any of these areas with a black before putting the metal down. These will just go on like a dream in one coat. The downside is you need something like isopropyl to clean your brushes. But the benefit is if you do go out of a line, you can just cover your, your, your brush in a bit of isopropyl. And then once you've done that, you can easily clean it off a surface that you weren't meant to get it on. So again, ups and downs. One other thing with it is you need to keep shaking it during use and you shouldn't do what I've done here and leave the bottle open because this is actually drying out very, very rapidly in that bottle that I've got open. I should have poured it into a separate container, but I was doing this in a rush. So once again, do what I say, not what I do. And I think you'll agree this comes out as an absolutely gorgeous gold color that will be weathered down a bit further when we do the final model. Speaking of that final model, please don't forget to check it out. Uh, check out this video later or subscribe to us so that you don't miss it. I will put a link here once the video is done so that you can go straight from this and watch how we paint the rest of the model and get it all complete. Ugh, ultramarines. Look, I've got to be honest, I don't love them. Weirdly, they're the model I've painted the most because trying to get paint reviews out there, they're the most iconic. But I'm just sick of seeing ultramarines. So I wanted to go a bit different with this one like I've done with my Blood Angels. So of course, if we're painting blue, then we start with red. Right, let me give you some color theory behind this. So I wanted to try the approach of making armor pop. So we've got blue armor. And then I thought if we go to the opposite side of the color wheel, then we choose that color as a contrasting color to the blue, which is gonna make the, the, the blue stand out more. But the opposite color to a blue is orange. And because we want a tonal shift as well, if we have a dark orange, then we've got brown and that's boring. It's not really very interesting in color. So I just moved across from there. I had a couple of ways to go. I could move to yellow or move to red. So I decided, well, if I move to yellow, it would look weird in the shadows. But if I move to red and have like a deep burgundy color, that could be interesting. So if anybody asks once again, I'm going to tell them, yep, this was completely planned and I knew exactly what I was doing. But the truth is I was just playing around here and well, it worked out really good. So basing the model, you don't have to do this, but I just used corn red in the base. 
Now, if I go from this red straight to my crag blue, that's going to be way too harsh. So I'm trying to find a mid-tone between them and I chose Cantor blue. And I'm just going to give this a full 90 degree application. So this is your typical zenithal highlight. I'm going to leave it in the deepest shadows, so things like under the legs and at the bottoms of the ankles. But I am literally just spraying it from the above, above and spinning the model around 90 degrees. So the only places you can still see that red are in the deepest shadows or right on the underside of the model if you were to flip it upside down. Once I've done that, this is where I'm going to be a bit more direct with the model. And a different approach here you may have noticed that I've taken is I've actually taken the shoulder pads off before I've begun. I'm going to paint those separately. I've done it different ways throughout this video to show you the different methods you can do to paint the models. But again, this is why I've done it that way. So here I'm being very focused with the airbrush. I'm trying to get it again not sort of 90 degrees spin it round, but I'm actually going from above and one side of the model. Not only do I want to have that transitioning color from McCrag blue to Cantor blue from above, but I also want it when you look at the model face on, you'll see the tonal difference, say across the face, across the chest, across one leg. So I'm focusing in lines down the legs because they're cylinders. I'm doing it from one side of the chest. I'm focusing very heavily on one side of the face. And this is what will give the actual arms, the legs and things like that the impression of form so it will give that impression of the leg being a cylinder because I've applied it only in a line down the model it gives your eyes that visibility of the third dimension as it goes from light to dark across that surface so this is what makes a model pop when you look at a photo of it in 2d that's what makes it stand out and go ah that's a 3d object the same as you would do if you draw it Moving up from that, I'm then doing spot highlights in Calgar blue, and these are just really spot highlights. So building this up very slowly, if we put too much of this on the model, then it'll completely mute down that color. But that is kind of what we want for ultramarines. We don't want it too, you know, bright and vibrant blue. So, you know, it's almost like a warm, warm sky blue, doesn't really make sense, but a, a, a deep sky blue, and I'm talking about the UK sky where it's got a little bit of gray in it. You know, if you go to Greece and you say sky blue, it's a very different blue. So a little bit of a muted blue in the highlights is going to give the overall tone of not too much of a bright, vibrant blue, which not only I th do I think looks more realistic, but it's just more appropriate for heresy era space marines as well. Moving on to the edge highlights, once again, Artist Opus Series D Medium, and we're going to use Fenrisian Grey, and I'm going to pick this out and just work it off my brush, and I'm going to use this to pick up all of the highlights, all of the edges on the model. So once again, if you haven't seen any of my other parts of the video, then this is the point where you can edge highlight a whole model in two or three minutes, if that. Now, as for the shoulder pads, now a lot of people will go gold for Ultramarines. That is a very modern take. I wanted to make it a bit older, so I could have gone two ways. I could have gone with the 90s scheme of having yellow shoulder pads and having a yellow chest eagle and things like that. I know we don't have chest eagles on these, but I could have put yellow into it, which I just think looks a bit too 90s, a bit too cartoony. I don't want to deny our roots of where we've come from, but you know, we're out of that Mike McVeigh era of painting. So instead of going with any kind of gold or crazy embellishments I instead decide to go with white almost in a style of a 40k veteran and to do the white on these because we've got blue armor which is a cool color we're stealing the world eaters paint scheme for the white and we're going to do it with a warm white so once again this is essentially the opposite of painting a world eater where that's white with blue shoulder pads this is blue with white shoulder pads. So I actually painted these two models at the same time and it, it was just a, such a fast process to do the opposite on each really, really quick, really, really simple. So starting with Storm Vermin Fur, we're gonna block in our shadows. And again, if you didn't watch the World Eaters section, it's the same recipe. We're using Grey Seer as the first stage of highlight, which it's only just ever so slightly a warm white. It reads to me as warm white. Um, but again, if you want something, if you haven't got this, you can just mix in a touch of a reddy brown, like Rhinox Hide, just like literally a smidge into a white color and it'll give you that as well. And then finally, for the topmost highlights, we're doing about 20 to 25% of these shoulder pads with Corax White, which to be fair is a neutral white, but as we add brightness to a model, it'll essentially bleach the surface anyway. So when you look at these, they're going to look really cool at the end, but yeah, so that's the final stage of this. Once again, I'll put a link up here when the guide to the full model goes live, but if you haven't already, please subscribe because then you're not going to miss it when it comes out. 
So Death Guard's actually my least customized model, and the reason for that is because I got this from Warhammer World during their Horus Heresy Open Day, and I wanted to rush and get the content out as fast as possible, ideally before anyone else. So this is just the bare model as it comes, but we are going to go through some interesting techniques, specifically around weathering. So I painted this initially in Rhinox Hide, and yes, I know it's some weird Sons of Horus colour, which is, I think, a spray paint I've yet to see released, but I painted it initially in Rhinox Hide, just a full covering over the entire model, and then to create a subsurface rusty effect, I stippled on some Mournfang Brown using an old sponge. So I then masked off the shoulder pads because they're going to be a different colour and we still want the subsurface, and then I used AK's worn effects fluid and I coated the model in this, and the next stage we kind of have to do pretty quick because this will completely cure in about an hour, so we've got about 20 minutes to do the next couple of stages. Now there's various different companies that do this kind of worn effect spray, but I've found that the AK one is the one that doesn't dry too fast, so this gives me a lot of working time to do these next two stages. You can just use something like hairspray, that will work to do this effect. So to start off, I've sprayed the entire model, completely coating it in Carrick Stone over that worn effects fluid. And then like in previous models, I've done a Zenithal, well not a Zenithal Prime, I've done a spot highlight or uh, a, I've picked out the forms and the shape of the forms using Typhon Ash and that's going to be my highlight colour across the whole surface. Then if you get a rough bristle brush, I find that the Citadel dry brushes work really well for this. Just coat that in water and soak the entire model and you'll find that this actually reactivates that worn effect fluid from underneath and then once that's done you can start brushing away all of the paint that you've painted over the worn effect fluid, thus revealing the subsurface underneath and giving you a nice worn worn effect and scatter. Now you can use loads of things for this, you can use the brushes, you can use needles, you can use pins and it gives them scratches and marks but the good thing about using a dry brush is it will pick it away from the edges naturally, some of the areas that would naturally get worn by just general wear and tear and I wanted to go really heavy with the weathering on my death guard almost as if to suggest the first part of their corruption is not really giving any any more of a care about armor maintenance where the other chapters would still try and keep their armor clean the death guard are just like nope we haven't got time to clean stuff we just want to get back into the fight so these guys are some of the most heavily heavily weathered of the entire range of models that I'll be painting to do the shoulder pads, I just, well, I did it the opposite way. So I masked up the rest of the model, covered it in worn effects fluid, and then spray painted the shoulder pads with Death Guard Green initially, and then highlighted with Ogryn Camo from above. As before, just take, just wet it and then take something like a brush and start working it off. I definitely went a bit over the top here, especially on the front of these shoulder pads, but what's really good is it actually makes the paint flake off, so some of the lighter colour at the top actually ended up sitting on top of the darker colour at the bottom, which if I'd done it a bit less heavy-handedly, I think it would have given me a much more natural result, but either way, it is a really good product to use and a good way to make weathering really quick and really simple, especially if you're doing it on vehicles like large tanks and things really really simple to do as with the rest of the chapters i'll put a link above but please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the video when it goes live for the thousand suns which is the 15th legion i wanted to do something very different to my previous paint techniques now, as for customization of this model, it is pretty much a standard out the box, although because I'm going to add some trim later, I've swapped out the shoulder pads for an earlier model shoulder pad with a really thin trim, so that's a bit more Horus Heresy era from the previous games. The head, this is from Colts 3D, honestly it's one of the the poorer 3D prints I've got, it's a very soft model, uh, the scale's not right, it, it's just, it's way too big for the model, but again, I'm not paying out to buy 10 heads when I just want one to make the model in the video look ever so slightly different, and we really need something looking a thousand sunsy. So if you haven't guessed already, we're going to be doing a candy coat over this model. Now, I've experimented with candy colours before because I really wanted the Alclad colours, uh, which I've done videos on before and previously, I wanted those to really stand out so I could showcase what they do and I've done a few models with them but in my experience the majority of those candy coats from the Alclad 2 range
range will fade over time. And I mean really fade. So things like the deep blue that I was using for my 40K Thousand Suns has actually turned into a washed out purple color. It looks horrible. It's ruined about 60 pounds worth of models. Now I have reached out to Alclad about those candy colors to find out what was going off. And whilst they were responding to me initially and said, yep, we'll have a look into it and get back to you. Uh, despite several emails since over numerous weeks, they have started completely ignoring any inquiries I've made into this and won't even help me figure out what the problem is. So sorry guys, I gave you the opportunity. That's completely on you. Your customer service is very poor in that regard. So I cannot recommend your Alclad 2 candy colors at all. That's on you guys, not me, sorry. Right, so candy colors. A lot of people say if you want the best candy color, spray it over gold. And a lot of people say it doesn't matter, spray it over silver. So as an attempt to create a bit of a zenithal or form highlight on this model, I sprayed it with Retributor Armor initially and then went back in afterwards with Vallejo model color silver because I was trying to get the transition through the candy layer so that we can go from light silver to dark warmer gold. Look, the be all and end all of, of this is it does not work. It doesn't matter. Now, a lot of people will say your candy coat's too thick. It really isn't. Like It just looks like that on camera for some reason. And if you watch how I apply this, if I didn't apply it thick enough, I'm actually going in there. My first initial coat was really, really orange. So I had no choice but to go in with a second coat and bring out the vibrancy and bring out the red. So it does need to go on a little bit thick, you know, thin it down quite a way anyway. Uh, but as you start to coat it over, once the red starts appearing, and it stops going from, from orange and starts appearing as red, you'll find that the, the gold and the silver don't make a difference whatsoever. Some people will say with a bronzy gold, that makes it warmer. Well, yeah, probably a little bit. The only way that I've found if you want to create a form-like highlight under your candy color is to leave some of the model in black and then highlight it with a metallic afterwards. Now, the shinier your metallic, the more of a reflection you're gonna get from beneath your candy coat. It's gonna be like a subsurface reflection, which is what makes the candy look more like a boiled sweet than a miniature. I think it looks cool. Obviously, you can just paint them red. It's completely up to you. But I just wanted to show this as a different approach on how to paint minis. But if you're wanting a zenithal highlight on your candy coat, what I recommend doing is spraying the model in black, leaving it black, and then only adding the silver in the areas that you want to be reflective and then leave it black. Especially with it being red, the, the black will actually you know, it'll make the red darker, it won't mute out the red, which is really good. Unlike other colors, it'll make it a bit more muddy. Obviously, black and yellow doesn't work, but black and red just makes dark red, which is really cool. So leave some of it black, spray the silver in your zenithal areas to, to highlight the forms of the model again. Like I've said with previous parts, that shoulder pads, knees, heads, bits you want to stick out, and then spray it over with your candy coat. A couple of thin coats with this, and it'll look absolutely beautiful. They really, really do stand out on the tabletop as an army, but one of the drawbacks of this is whilst they look good as an individual model and the photos look good, when you're looking at them as an army, it does. it's, it's hard to pick out the details from a distance. That is just what it is. But when you've got a candy, a candy army on the table entirely against your opponent's force, that looks good. It's just, it's hard to make out the, the details because they're so, the, the effect is so shiny and so reflective. But anyway, that's how you do candy colors. Let me know what you think. If you've got a different approach, by all means, let me, down at, no, let me know down in the comments. But I just think this is a really cool effect and I wanted to showcase really quickly how to do it. As for this one though, I just wanted to make some of the forms stand out. So I use Tamiya black panel liner in the recesses. Now there is an argument, as I said before, if you're wanting some of this to stand out, but stay candy, maybe I should have done this on the silver layer before I applied the candy coat. But either way, it's, it's your model, it's your hobby, whatever you wanna do, that's fine. That might have been a better way for me to approach it. I might try that next time. And once again, I'll put a link up above when this model's complete so you can see the full guide and how we finished it, but please subscribe so that you don't miss it when it gets released. Ah, Sons of Horus, the 16th Legion. And these are the poster boys along with the Imperial Fists on the new Horus Heresy Age of Darkness box set. And you might think it's really simple to do this color scheme. They've got two colors for the, Hor the Sons of Horus Legion anyway, Lupercal Green and Sons of Horus Green. No. So if you're looking at any of the box art, they've actually steered away from a lot of this and they've now gone with a different green recipe that hasn't been made clear through the Warhammer community team. 
So in order to recreate this, I had to do a few experiments. So I took an old Primaris Marine that I'm not going to paint anytime soon and just started throwing greens at it. I started with the Cabalite green and then highlighted with Cyberite green, but this was still a bit too muted and a little bit too washed out. If you have a look at the official artwork, it starts as a very deep dark blue green and then goes up to the really vivid Cyberite Cabalite green. So after a few days and a few tests posting on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter asking people what they think the best recipe was, what I went with in the end started with Incubi Darkness. So if you want to follow this scheme, then start off by covering the entire model in Incubi Darkness. And if you aren't going over green like I am here, it'll actually come out a lot darker. So if you're going straight over black, then it should be a really deep dark blue. I had to go really heavy with this in order to decrease the saturation and in order, well, in order to increase the saturation of it and cover over all the green that I'd done on this test model in the earlier stage. And then once you've got that blocked in, the next part of it is you want to go in with some Cabalite green. And this one, you want a very minimal amount on the surface of the model. I actually went too hard. So I, on my test marine, I nailed it and left most of the model in the Incubi Darkness and then only put the smallest amount of Cabalite green. On the actual model, this one here, which I've customized with, I think I've done a custom head and a shoulder pad. The shoulder pad was from Colts 3D and also it was the chest plate, which I wouldn't recommend those chest plates because you need to carve up the entire model and use green stuff. I've just left a big hole in it beneath the chest plate, but again, no one's going to know unless I tell them. So with those customizations on there, when I painted this model, I put way too much Cabalite green on here. So I would say you probably want maybe 50 to 75% in Incubi Darkness and then only the top part of it, the uppermost 25% to maybe 30, 50% with the Cabalite green with a fade. Uh, again, my test model was much better than the final model I did. So try to copy what I did earlier than what I'm doing here. Once you've got that armor fade in, then it's just a case of using Cyberite green. And here I've done the edge highlighting. Once again, Artis Opus Series D medium dry brush just to do my edge highlighting in minutes, seconds even. I probably did this whole model in less than a minute. And then just to really pop the color, we're gonna use Screaming Skull in the furthermost extremities. I've used this quite a lot as a highlight color, and the reason for that is, again, sunlight highlights tend to be a warmer white. Sunlight is a warm color. So, you know, unlike a lot of people say daylight is quite neutral. It's not neutral, it's on the warmer spectrum. So, again, Games Workshop don't really have an ice white, so the closest we've got is this. And if I was really bothering, I'd probably mix a little bit of yellow in there, just a smidge of yellow just to give it more of an ice white color but we're going to use this to really make the furthermost extremities pop and just make sure the shapes of the model the armor plates really stand out once again as i've said when i've done the complete model and put the guide up i'll, I'll link it above but please subscribe so that you don't miss it when it comes out now word bearers for me Honestly, this part of the guide is a little bit boring. Um, it was really easy to customize this model. I couldn't really find any custom heads or paper. I did 3D print a little book that would hang off the belt of the model, which had a chain on it, but that chain just wouldn't print. And I couldn't be bothered to keep trying to reprint it because it took ages. But there are some good little parts of the Horus Heresy set. So things like these scrolls are actually on the accessories sprue. So I've taken a couple of those here. I've shaved it down and got rid of the grenade on one of them and hidden that behind Find the little emblem that hangs off his off the weapon that he's holding and I've just put more of them on there so at least then we've got something word bearery and written but honestly this armor doesn't really pop until the final stages when we start adding either freehand writing or decals all over it to show that he's got words written all over the plates of his armor so we're just going here through the more burgundy spectrum of red so we're starting off with barrack nar burgundy which is a good color it's a really nice burgundy color but it's very thin so three an airbrush or with a brush it will take several coats to get it on your model which is you know i wouldn't recommend using this color with a brush unless you're going over white but if you do that it'll end up too bright maybe a gray primer would be good thankfully i've got the airbrush so i don't need to worry about it i just need to do more coats 
Next up is corn red. So this was our previous darkest red burgundy color. So now we can actually use this as a highlight, which is really good. So as I've done in previous armors, I am focusing on the form. So I'm spraying the shoulder pads, the heads, the tops of the knees, anything that's a cylinder gets a line, anything that's round gets a spot. It's pretty much that all the way through. I'm focusing on areas like the head because I want them to stand out. I want the feet to stand out. I want the hands to stand out because these are focal points on the model. So I want those to be the brightest. So I'm going over the different forms on the model, things like the backpack. When I do the backpack, it's actually I only spray from one side of the backpack just to add some interest across the surface as opposed to that horrible, that you, sorry, horrible, not horrible, that usual just top down. The top is light, the, the bottom is dark. When I look at the model face on, I want to see some contrast across the surface, not just from above to below. So that adds a little bit more interest to it. And again, just build this up slowly and steadily, and you'll find that you get a nice transition from the corn red to the Barracknar burgundy and it gives a good interesting face to the model. And to finish off, we're going to edge highlight using Wasdaka Red, which is essentially a light burgundy. It's light red if you want, but it's more on the burgundy, more of a purple red. So again, just work this into your Artis Opus dry brush. You can use any dry brush you like, but these dome dry brushes, like if you're gonna get a cheaper dry brush, that's fine, but get a dome dry brush where you can work it in and twist it round on the bristles because this is going to be picked up more and it's gonna give you a much smoother result. The benefit of the Artis Opus ones is they are really tightly packed hairs so you get a much softer transition on your surface and it looks a lot less cheaply dry brushed and a lot more okay they've actually put some effort into that it still looks dry brushed but it looks dry brushed professionally if I can not think of a better way of saying it but again we're just going to use this and we're going to paint all the Wasdaka red on the corners this is a bit of a lighter color to apply so you might need a couple of coats let it dry just don't go in there too heavy because you'll start pulling wet paint off with these brushes and you just want to build it up slowly and steadily with these colors it, they are harder to apply sorry you know that's just what it is I've not seen a brand where these colors really do pop and really do stand out and they're really opaque so you know, GW are limited here just by the properties of the pigments that go into these. So build it up slowly and steadily. It'll take you a little bit longer than most other chapters, most other colors, but so long as you take your time, and build this up steadily, you'll get a really nice result that'll make the armor pop. I think if I went any lighter here on this color, it'd really stand out and we'd start losing that burgundy and that, that richness of the red. So I'm not going any higher here than Wasdaka and I'll make this model look better when we do the final video, which once again, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it when it comes out, but I'll put a link up above when we've actually got that video live. Salamanders are our 18th Legion, and I have painted a few of these for 40k, but for Horus Heresy, I wanted to really mute down the green. So again, it was a bit more grim, a bit more dark, but I didn't want to take it away from Salamanders and make it look like a Dark Angel. And whilst I've posted this online in a few social channels and a few people have said it looks Dark Angels-y, that's only because I haven't put the Salamanders elements on that part of it, which you'll see in this video, it'll start to look very Dark Angels-y, and then immediately it'll pop to Salamanders and you'll go, ah, yeah. Yeah, that works. So starting off with Nocturne Green, which we used in our Space Wolves guide. So this is, again, it's a very, very black green. It looks a lot more uh, a lot more green here than it does in real life. It really does look like black, but with a tint of green. And once again, I'm using the air version of this, which GW are about to discontinue at the time this video goes live. However, I'm hoping that they at least keep the opaque layer star paint so that I can thin it down myself and continue to airbrush this color because not enough brands out there do a black green. There are a couple, Pro Acryl do one, but this is the deepest, darkest green I can come across. So here I'm painting the entire model, making sure to get into all the shadows because I want those shadows to be green, not black. And again, you can have them black if you want, but this is really going to help enforce the rest of the armor scheme. Right, now ignore this part of the video, it's where I was testing. So I did my initial highlight coat in Lupercal Green, but this was way too bright, way too vibrant. I was thinking, hmm, maybe the, the Sons of Horus colors will actually make a decent Salamanders color. In my opinion, they don't. So this is the part of, it, part of the video where you can completely ignore because I'm about to paint over this and start again. What actually makes more sense, both in the lore and the color scheme, is to use Vulcan Green, which obviously Salamanders, Vulcan, Primark, you know, so I painted over this again with Nocturne Green. I actually went back to black, then Nocturne Green, and then I'm going over it with Vulcan Green. And I'm not really doing a form highlight with this. I'm actually trying to highlight 
all of the models. So I'm leaving a little bit of shadow in the Nocturne green, but I'm doing most of the model, probably about 80% in the Vulcan green, so we can start to bring it up. And I think as you look at this, it's very much a kind of camo green, which takes us away from salamanders and honestly a little bit more towards uh, Grimdark Dark Angels or or Grimdark 40k Dark Angels. But again, stick with me because when we get the highlight colors on here, and especially accent the shoulder pads, this is when everything pops and you go, oh yeah, that does look like a really good salamander's color, especially for Horus Heresy. So the initial armor colors are literally that. They are Nocturne Green and Vulcan Green, which gives us a very dark color. Now, next up from there, we're gonna go in with Lauren Forest, which again, I'm dry brushing this, Artis Opus Series D dry brush, but this is a very watery color, which is a disappointment because I really, really like this color. It's a great green to highlight with. In fact, I highlight my Grimdark Dark Angels with this as well. So it is a great color to work with, but it's very, very watery. So you've got to work a lot off your brush, but the problem is when you work a lot off your brush, what's left is dry so you kind of need to put it on your brush work it all off do a bit of the model put it more on your brush work it off do it and you've just got to repeat it and go to the palette a lot more than you would any other color but once you work with it and get it in it absolutely pops and it's really beautiful so this is one where if you do prefer to brush your colors on and paint it on then yeah definitely you know brush in your edge highlights it'll work wonders when you do that especially over a over a matte coat uh, that's on there before because it grips really well but when you dry brush it it's just a little bit wet can be a bit of a pain especially if, well it can be a pain for edge highlighting but if you're wanting to use it to smush colors in and blend colors that's where it works really really well but for edge highlighting dry brushing can be a bit of a pain Another stage up from that, I had no choice in the last stage but to smush in and blend in some of the Lauren Forest. I'm using Elysian Green and this one is a little bit better but still a pain when it comes to doing edge highlights. So you'll see that Elysian Green is a similar in tone to Lauren Forest but it's got more yellow in because we're moving with Salamanders, they have a very vibrant green. So this is where we're taking the dark camo green and moving it in more into that warm spectrum of green which Salamanders are known for. So again, Artis Opus Series dry brush just very carefully build this onto the surface of the model but you want to try and cover a lot of the edge highlights and let it blend in a little bit because this is going to be what brings the warmth back to the green on the model to finish it off we're really going to make these salamanders pop now and this is the bit where you'll go oh yeah and it does turn them into salamanders so using the yellow we're just going to go over like we did in previous models where we we did white with the furthermost extremities we're going to do this with yellow this time and just this little bit on a few edges really influences the eye and says yep these are salamanders these are not dark angels now, whilst I've not done it in a lot of the guides on this video, I am going to do the shoulder pads here because I think even though I've been focusing on the armor colors in this series, what I'm going to do is put this in here because, well, two reasons. One, I think the flames are a necessary part of the Salamander's armor, but also AK sent me some of their Gen 3 acrylics, which I've seen a lot of people using and wanted to get hands on with. So this is me just playing about with it. And I've got to say, first-hand experience of these colors, this is the first time I've used them. They are absolutely incredible. And the good thing about this is one of the sets they sent me, it's a four color set. It's actually a flame effect set made specifically to be four colors for the flame effects. So here I am putting this, this initial red color down. Now this is, you know, similar to something like Wazdaka red. The coverage wasn't excellent it did take a couple of coats to get on there but it was really really smooth and i didn't have the normal gloopy problems that i have with a lot of other brands citadel included so i would highly recommend trying out some of these ak paints a lot of pro level painters are really starting to flock towards them and through through my experience i would describe them as the missing link between Pro Acryl's coverage and something like Scale 75's uh, blendiness or, or um, kind of like their, their liquid pigment style of being able to have the Pro artistic blend. So again, get the red down, get the light red down on here on the flames and having these 3D printed shoulder pads, which is the only thing I did on this model to make it stand out from the crowd, the only customization work I did, having these 3D flames on there really helped me with with the next two stages. So after AK's Scarlet Red, I'm then going in with Medium Orange. And again, to speed things up, I'm just going to dry brush this on. And unlike many other brands, I always find that Orange is an absolute nightmare in any brand for coverage. But with this AK series, 
this was spot on. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't like the most amazing coverage ever, but for an orange, yeah, this really stood out. Not only did it go down well, it went over red in one coat, but it was also really nice and vibrant in that one coat, so I didn't have to go through and do another pass. So. Yeah, AK Interactive Gentry colors. If I found nothing else, I've now found my new favorite orange. So it was then just a case of dry brushing again, this time from with Radiant Yellow, again from the same series, same box, it's their Flame Effects box. And I just dry brushed this down, but this time from above, so I was only picking up the top edges of these flames and not covering all the orange that I'd just painted. And to finish it off, I'm using from the same set their Ice Yellow. And I've mentioned Ice Yellow a few times in this in this series because, or in this video, because it's one of the colors that Games Workshop just don't do. But Vallejo have a good one. And now through testing, AK Interactive have a really good one as well. And you'd be surprised just how much a color like this really helps when highlighting or putting colors in or mixing. Whenever you want to put a highlight on a model, it's a great color to come to because it comes out as a natural daylight highlight color. So so again, I'm just dry brushing this on from above and that's my flames done in absolute minutes. I'm rubbish at freehand. I don't have any decals to do this. So having the 3D flames on here really made this super simple. Just to finish this off for now, for the video, I did use some Corvus Black. I didn't want a true black because I want the option of shading down a little bit later, but getting this in, it did take a couple of thin coats like many GW colors too. I think it took about three coats because I wanted to put it down really thin and get it smooth. But once you black out the shoulder pads with something like this, this is when it really pops. Now look at this model and tell me it doesn't look like a salamander even though it's dark and muted. Once again, I'll put a link up above when the full video goes live, but if you're watching this before we've done that and you're interested, please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it when it comes out. Okay, we're on the home stretch now. Is anybody still watching? Hopefully. Right, so if you've just skipped this part, we've done a lot of things. In fact, we've already done black when we did our Dark Angels with the First Legion. Now we're on the 19th Legion. So with this one, I did Dark Angels in a cool black. I wanted to do this differently, but I didn't necessarily want to do it as a warm black. I just wanted to have it a jet black. So I'm starting over a black primer, a jet black primer, jet black primer, which is Vallejo's black primer through the air brush, I'm going in with Corvus Black because getting this on there, it's a neutral black, but it will also allow us to shade it down later. So when I put the oil washes in at the end of painting this model, I can actually get the recesses back to true black. And even though the model will look black, you'll see that the recesses look a darker black than the rest of the model. So having Corvus Black as a base is really good. In fact, it's one of my favorite new GW colors and I will continue to use it. An alternate color that I'd also use is something like Coal Black from uh, Pro Acryl, one of my favorite ranges of paints, but to be honest, that's a bit too matte for this technique that we're going through. By the way, I also got the shoulder pads and the helmet online. The helmet is a 3D print, and I think you'll agree that for Raven Guard especially, this makes the beaky looking Mark VI Marine look a lot more beaky. Beaky. B-E-A-K-I-E -E versus B-E-A-K-Y. That's what I'm trying to say. It's got a beak. So once we've done that, I'm then doing my form highlight, my spot highlighting with Eshing Grey. And this one is going to be very mild, very light. I'm just building it up really slowly. I don't even really want you to see it. It's just going to be a very slight top of the head, top of the shoulders, the very tips of the knees, the feet, the hands, you know, things like that. I'm not going to build it up so the model looks, looks too grey. It will look too grey if we go too heavy with this, but I'm just highlighting the uppermost surfaces of the model just so we can give it a little bit of a tonal contrast. But again, Eshing grey is a neutral grey. It's not warm, it's not cool, and this is what's going to give us that jet black look. And I keep saying jet black look, you know what I mean by jet black, like, you know, stealth bomber kind of look. And the reason I'm going for that is, well, you know, Raven Guard, birds, birds, planes, planes, jet, jet, jet black. So it just makes sense to me, law wise. I don't know. Again, it's your hobby. You can do it a cool black, a warm black. You can do them white if you want. So, but either way, I'm just trying to get a very, very jet black look to these models because birds are jets. Does that make sense? 
Our lighting wise, I'm using Dawnstone and yep, this is a very different tonal contrast, uh, a very different tonal value to what we've had with things like Eshing Grey and Corvus Black. But again, having a very stark highlight shows that the surface of the armor isn't very reflective. So the fact that we've gone very, very low tonal gray through Eshing Grey, and then we're going to this really bright Dawnstone gives the suggestion to the eye that the surface of the armor is very matte and very dark, it's not very reflective, but then the edges are going to pick up light naturally, just like anything would in real life. So again, a little bit more rule of cool than rule of real, because it's not going to look like realistic light, but it will make the model pop and it'll make the forms pop. And it'll also give that very matte look, almost, as I've said previously, like a jet bomber more than a reflective Harley Davidson chassis or something like that. Now with the previous step, I have focused on areas like the face because I want that to stand out more. And then here I'm going in with some gray here. And like with previous parts of the tutorial, I want the furthest outmost extremities to have that final touch of highlight. So once again, I'm focusing on the head, but I'm also, you know, just making sure that the, the, the part of the beak, the uppermost part of the beak really stands out. Things like the, the head pauldron, the stripe down the head, but also the top of the shoulder pauldrons, the tops of the knees. I just want to get them a bright to color and I'm also going to focus on the studs because I think I'm going to leave the majority of this model in black, wash it in a black oil wash and then the only lighter parts of the model are going to be the wings on the shoulder pads. So I'm going to get them to stand out and I think I might add some cool blue in there. I don't know how I'm going to approach this. If you want to find out how we get on with this, once it's done I'll put a link up above as I've said with all the other ones just to link you to the full video when it's complete but so that you don't miss it please subscribe to my channel. Now, many of you might agree that I've saved the best to last. Well, that wasn't intentional. I didn't make the Alpha Legion the 20th Legion. It's just the order they come in. So here we're going to be using contrast over a metallic base. Now, first off, what I want to do is get this to be the shiniest metallic possible. So I've done a video on this, but for argument's sake, just trust me, unless you're going to go watch that video, if you want your gloss or you want, if you want your silver or metallic paint to be really shiny, if it's the right type of metallic and it's got some opaque properties like the one we're about to use, then you definitely want to get a gloss coat down first. Now I've put a gloss black primer over a matte black primer and that's only because I wasn't paying attention and just primed them all in one go and then realized when I came to paint it, oh yeah, we want gloss black. The glossier, the better. If you can use an enamel-based gloss, even better, but I'm just using Vallejo's gloss black primer. Not the glossiest, but it's still better than anything else. If you don't have a gloss black primer, then you can. It does work if you put a black primer down and then put a gloss coat over it. It pretty much does the same thing. So I'm using Vallejo's Metal Color Chrome and this is brilliant through an airbrush. It's made to go through an airbrush. You don't need to thin it. All you need to do is pour it into your airbrush and spray. And I am coating the entire model in this. I'm not doing any kind of zenith or clever highlighting. I'm just coating the entire model in this. And the beauty is you don't need an airbrush to do this because this, br this paint brushes on beautifully. But for speed, I'm just getting it through the airbrush and I'm going to coat the entire model to make it a shiny, reflective, chromish layer. Now, I'm actually stealing some of this recipe, kind of, from Artis Opus. They did their Alpha Legion in a very similar way, but because they brush paint it on, what they did was mix Talisar Blue with the Pterodon Turquoise to get the properties of one paint, but the color of another. And it ever so slightly blued down the color of the Pterodon Turquoise. Here, what I'm doing is I'm going pure Pterodon Turquoise because I think that's a more appropriate Legion, uh, appropriate color, for the Alpha Legion. I am gonna leave a little bit of the top silver because then I'm gonna spray that from above with Athematic Blue. You don't need to do that. I don't think it added much to me, but I sprayed it from above in the Pterodon, uh, from below, sorry, in the Pterodon Turquoise and then left some of the top of the head and the top of the shoulders silver and then went over with Athematic Blue. If you cover it with Pterodon Turquoise, the Athematic Blue won't do anything. It'll just mute and muddy the turquoise color. So you don't wanna do that. Once that's covered in dry, what I'm then doing to add a bit of a color shift. Now I'm using that as a noun, a describing word. I'm not saying color shift. So Green Stuff World, please don't sue me. I'm not saying these are color shift paints that you own the, own the copyright on. I'm saying I'm creating a color 
shift okay is that clear please don't copyright strike this video so anyway i'm creating a shift in color from the turquoise to the telesar blue so what i'm doing is turning the model upside down and spraying it from below so then you'll actually see the color change on the model so when you look at it from the front it'll look like it's shifting in color but actually it's just static color with a blend from the turquoise to the blue and i think this adds a really interesting look to the Alpha Legion and gives it that almost shifty appearance that we want to achieve, yet it does it with Citadel colors and Citadel contrast paints really quick through an airbrush, kind of Artis Opus's approach, but with our own take on it, and this is the result you get at the end. And just to finish this off, like with all the other armies, we want to do an edge highlight. So we're using Vallejo's Air Silver here, which is a really strong silver and brilliant for airbrushing with. So I'm gonna once again flip the model upside down, especially with the scales on the shoulder pad. This is gonna look really great. And we're gonna pick out all of the edges with that silver color, and it's gonna really make the forms and the two color tone that we put in previously, all of that's gonna really pop. So there you go, that's it done. Keep an eye out on our channel for future videos. Please subscribe so that you don't miss our future tutorials. And when we've finished this model, we'll put that up as a full video. And also just, I'll put the link up above when we've done that, but subscribe so you don't miss it. So with that, I'm gonna call it a day. Please give a huge thanks to our patrons. And if you want to see the full tutorial videos, then join our patron because they're gonna be going up there first as soon as they're done. And then I'll be releasing them at a rate of around one a week for the next 18 weeks, hooray. So keep an eye out. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. If you've got any further questions to ask, please put them down in the comments. I do try and respond to every single question I've got. So let me know if there's anything you need to know about these guides. Please like the video if you enjoyed watching it and don't forget to subscribe because only 20% of our audience are actually subscribers to this channel and that's what helps us get known by letting YouTube know that we are popular and people want to see what we've got to put out. So please hit the subscribe button and if you really want to help, that notification bell too. That's all from me. Thanks a lot. See you guys next time. Bye.